PCO Club in Podio, and there's a topic request that has a list of every place that you can submit a question. Okay, and there's all kinds of webinar uh, options. There's the Live with Laureen, the Did You Knows, and, and the support calls like the one we're on here, plus our Q&A webinar. So uh, you can go to any of those and submit a topic request. If I can get the cco.us website up, I'll show you a little copy of that in just a moment, but that's why I put this link on there for you. But again, it's just cco.us. And then you go to contact us, and then you go to topic request. Very simple. Now, let's move on to what our first topic is going to be over. If you did not know, that's an actual view of red blood cells, human red blood cells. And of course, it's in a microscope. You know, they always show the pictures of the little round concave circles, and they're usually bright, bright red, but this is actually what your blood cells look like in your body. And they're supposed to be that shape. You can see how they're kind of concave in nature. But when people have different disorders, they either have, you know, like myeloplastic disorder or something, some type of anemia, they'll have less blood, red blood cells or misshapen blood cells. But I wanted to share that with you because we are definitely going to talk about anemia tonight. There's a lot of things going on with anemia. anemia. And when you're coding anemia, you have to know is some, some pertinent some pertinent, thing, pertinent things about the patient in regards to what else is going on uh, to get the right guideline to code for. The question that had come in to our student support hub though for the CCO club is our patient actually had cancer and they had acquired the anemia during their chemotherapy. Now a little heads up, you know chemotherapy we always think of that as uh, people getting medication for cancer, but the term chemotherapy itself just means that you're getting therapy with chemicals and quite honestly everything that any type of medication and stuff would actually be chemotherapy, wouldn't it? So just because it says um, chemotherapy and if you're not, uh, nobody's going to use it outside by the term of treating for cancer, but just, just know that, that uh, you may be getting continued therapy, but you're not getting the same chemotherapy as somebody that's getting the cancer diseases. And there's some more specific descriptions of that in the guidelines, and I'm going to show that to you. So let's look at our case. And I'm going to just move this over. This should be good. Now, if you can't see this, you can make a note in the chat. But here's our scenario. Mrs. Blue is seen today feeling fatigued, and her family states that she's been rather listless for the past two days. They're also concerned that she's looking rather pale. Her chemotherapy treatment, um, our treatments are on schedule. Lab tests done today reveal a hemocrit, uh, a level of 29.4. This is the first time during the course of her chemo treatments that she has suffered from anemia due to chemo medications. I will adjust her chemo accordingly and monitor her for the need of a transfusion. Oral iron pills taken daily times 14 days to start. Retest hematocrit in one week. Continue with IV infusion today of fluid. So what do we have? We have a patient that has anemia but she's also on chemotherapy. And there's something really important that should jump off the page for you. And it's this statement right here. Anemia due to chemotherapy medications. That should leap for you. So I'm gonna underline that. And I'm also going to just give that a little pale highlight. Let's, let's just make that. that that changes everything, okay? Anemia due to chemo medications. That means guidelines are different than a person who just has anemia. 
Now let's let's go ahead and talk about the signs and symptoms of anemia first because if you're doing coding on a more, I don't want to say basic level, but let's go back to the basics here. When a person has a diagnosis that explains the signs and symptoms, we don't code the signs and symptoms in physician-based coding, outpatient coding, do we? So our patient was listless, they were feeling fatigued. Some other signs and symptoms of anemia with a hematocrit uh, level being low besides going to be uh, weakness, fainting, pallor, paler, uh, or pallor, however you want to say it. Remember the person, they say the family thought that she was pale. Shortness of breath, dizzy, dizziness, flushing, headaches, enlarged spleen, and extreme dehydration when there's a lack of sweating, lack of urination, and dry mouth. All of that can be signs and symptoms of anemia. Now normally, you know, uh, we would be able to, to, to guess that, but let's say that she was having shortness of breath. Well, you don't necessarily associate shortness of breath with being anemic, do you? So it might be another condition that you might think that you have to code for. But if there's nothing else going on and the doctor doesn't address it separately as something else going on, then it's a sign and symptom of the anemia, right? It's very important when you're learning to code to understand the disease process for what you're coding and that involves the signs and symptoms and the treatment. So hematocrit level, that's what they're going to check. If you don't know, a normal hematocrit for a female is I think um, 35 to 50, but you can Google that anytime and find out what that is. But uh, the hematocrit is what checks the uh, red blood cells. All right now, what else do we want to take away from this? What makes this case different for the anemia? It's the chemo. Anything else? Anybody want to jump in and say something else that makes a difference? And let me just move my go to meeting over here and I'm going to see if I can't monitor your comments. I don't know that I can, but I'm going to try. Okay, let me boys got boy to jump in and say something for us. Normally we do this a lot different guys. This is uh, something that I love it to be very, very interactive. So feel free to ask questions. If you're able to chime in and verbally ask a question, that's even better. Okay, you don't it's have a little to bit of a delay, but you're, but you're okay, uh, Alicia, we hear you okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. There's the website if you wanted to get the pictures of this theydiffer.com is where I got that. Again, anemia with complications. That's what this is going to be. So what do the guidelines tell us to do? If you have your manuals out, which I hope that you do, I want you to go to 1C2C2 because that's where this guideline is. All right? So while I'm talking, I want you to actually go there in your manuals. That will be in the front of your ICD-10 manuals. We're looking at actually a complication. So coding and sequencing of complications. Then we're going to go to anemia associated with malignancy. Again, this is not normal anemia. There's specific guidelines for coding anemia, except, especially the sequencing. But when it involves malignancies, that changes everything. So let's look over this first guideline. It says, when your encounter is for management of an anemia associated with the malignancy and the treatment is only for anemia, the appropriate code for the malignancy is sequenced as the principal or the first listed diagnosis, followed by the appropriate code for the anemia, such as the code for D63.0 anemia in neoplastic disease. Okay. Now, two, that changes things. 
me scroll down here just a bit. Let's look at this guideline. Anemia associated with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation therapy. So all of those things can cause a person to have anemia. And that's different. When the encounter is for the management of anemia associated with an adverse effect of the chemotherapy or the immunotherapy, and the only treatment is for the anemia, the anemia code is sequenced first, followed by the appropriate codes for the cancer. Okay, and then that's telling you T45. 0.1 x5 adverse effect of uh, adenoplastic and immunosuppressive drugs. That's what we're looking at. This word right here, adenoplastic, they're getting medication for cancer. Okay, and this is this little part right here is just what page in my guidelines that that shows up, but that's not going to be the same because we don't necessarily use the same ICD-10 manual. So don't worry about this page 29 of 114. So when the admission or the encounter, and we're doing encounters, is for management of an anemia associated with an adverse effect of radiotherapy, okay, the anemia should be sequenced first, followed by appropriate neoplasm codes uh, y a 4.2 for the radiation treatment. Okay. Now this is important too. This is uh, or of later complication without mention of a misadventure at the time of the procedure. Okay, let's scroll down. Now let's look at 1C214. Hmm, encounter for complication associated with a neoplasm. When an encounter is for the management of a complication associated with the cancer, such as dehydration, and then again, that's the page that this is on, treatment is only for the complication. The complication is coded first, followed by the appropriate codes for the neoplasm. The exception to the guideline is anemia. When the encounter is for the management of anemia associated with the malignancy and the treatment is for only the anemia. The appropriate code for the malignancy is sequenced as the principle of first listed diagnosis followed by the code D6304, anemia in neoplastic disease. Okay. So now let's look back up at our encounter. What jumps off the page for us? The fact that our patient has anemia and he specifically states that it's due to chemo medications. That's the first thing that we need to, to, to look at. The second thing is why is the patient being seen? Well, she's seen today feeling fatigued and her family states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she came back into the doctor because she's fatigued. Her, her family's concerned about her and that she's pale. So she's obviously going, undergoing chemo treatments because he's going to adjust her chemo accordingly so that you know, they can tweak some of the medications. Some of them have a tendency to um, you know, have, have uh, uh, cause anemia or cause dehydration or maybe a, a dryness or a scratchiness to the skin. Okay, There's all kinds of things that they can adjust for. And that's another thing if you didn't know, every time a patient comes in to have their chemo treatment, it isn't necessarily the same thing they got the visit before. Right? They're always adjusting according to blood levels, etc., and all kinds of other things. So I will adjust her chemo accordingly and monitor her for the need of a transfusion if it were to get worse. They are, he's actually going to treat it by having her take oral iron for 14 days. Okay, then he's going to retest her hematocrit. So again, they're continuing, it says continue with IV infusion. Uh, today of fluids. Now, why would they be doing that? Would they be doing that because that's why she came di she came in? Because when you have cancer, sometimes you're given that. Um, 
or is that treatment for the anemia, boosting the fluid levels? Okay, actually, we don't know. But we know she's seen today for feeling fatigue. So I'm going to say, and we would inquire with the provider, uh, is that why you're giving the patient IVs is because uh, her, she's fatigued and her, uh, her hematocrit is low? Or is, was she coming in today for a routine IV infusion for fluids? They usually, like the week after you have your chemotherapy, a lot of times they'll give you IV infusions. Right? And that knowledge, that information right there is what is going to make a difference in the codes that we use for our patient. Let's look at some of those codes that they mentioned just before we move on. I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit. Okay, so this first one, D63.0. I'm going to bring that up in our wonderful find a code. I love find a code. Anemia and neoplastic disease. Sorry, this is slow, guys. Usually my computer's much faster than this. So here we go. If you are being seen as anemia and neoplastic disease, if you use D63.0, they're telling you first to code the type of cancer that the patient has, right? And those codes are going to be in this range, C00 through D49. However, Look right here on this excludes one. Anemia due to atenoplastic chemotherapy. That's what our patient that we just talked about is getting, D64.81. Then there's another one here, aplastic anemia. So that's a different type of anemia, right? So if, if our patient just has anemia and it's you know, not due to the cancer, but it's the fact that she has um, cancer, okay, then again, we're going to use D63.0. And, you know, think about this. She could have uh, bone, well, no, let's see, bone is usually white blood cells. Your spleen produces. Maybe she has a uh, cancer that's affecting her spleen. You don't really get cancer of the spleen. I've never heard of that. Hmm. Sorry, just needed a little sippy sippy there. Okay, so that's that situation. But our patient has anemia due to the chemotherapy. He specifically said that. So let's look at D64.81. So flip over there in your manuals real quick. Let's see here. anemia induced by the chemotherapy. That's the code, D64.81. See how the, the guidelines apply? And again, the exclude here is, you know, do they have aplastic anemia? No, our person just has anemia. And the excludes to anemia in neoplastic disease, D63.0. Now, if you're visiting us or if you're in our um, uh, PBC course, a physician-based coding course for our people training to take the CPC, I guarantee you this is a very likely code that you're going to see come up on one of these codes. You're going to either see D63.0 or D64.81. That's a, that's a guideline that they are going to test you on. They want to know if you understand the difference between the usage of D63.0 and D64.81. What are we going to see that's going to make that difference? We're going to see verbiage, like this case, and they'll be blatant about it. There's no tricking. You know, they're not trying to trick, trick you. It's that they will specifically say the anemia is due to her chemo treatments. All right? Very 
Very good. Any questions coming through? I'm looking at the chat. I'm not seeing any right now. But don't worry. Since we're working with a little bit of a delay here, feel free to put something in the chat or let me know. Okay. Highlighted points for a cancer patient that has anemia versus a cancer patient who has anemia due to the chemotherapy. Moving on. One of my favorite organs of the body to talk about is the heart. And I can tell you in our chapter 10 of the PBC course, it's cardiology. A lot of people struggle with that chapter. The cardiology chapter is, is guideline intensive and it is also terminology intensive. If you know the anatomy of the heart, you'll do better with cardiology questions. I'm really good about telling you if it's something that you just need to be aware of or if in fact I think that you need to memorize it. And the heart is something that I believe you need to memorize a majority of the anatomy of the heart. Right? Some basics here we're going to look at just, you know, an outside view is the aorta. Then there's four chambers of the heart. I did not get a picture view of that. You're able to do that. Go Google it. Go look in your um, anatomy and terminology book if you have one. We have one, a fabulous one for coders that we sell on the website. But you need to know what the four chambers of the heart are called and what the valves are called. Okay? You need to know that this is the pulmonary vessel and this is the aorta and you need to understand what a myocardial infarction is, what the abbreviation is for all of these terms. MI is a heart attack and the um, abbreviations for uh, the, the valves in the heart, where they're located, okay, and common disorders for them. If a person has a heart attack, if you aren't aware, let's get to the basics again, ultimately what's happening is that you have a blockage of the vessel. Now this could be in a vein or it could be in an artery. Here they're showing the two different uh, vessels as blue and red. That's pretty common, you know. So they're saying right here in this little jointed area, there's a blockage and it could be a number of reasons why it was blocked. It could be that their um, prothrombin time is um, is off and they've got thickening of their blood and then they've got atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic heart disease. They could have hyperlipidemia. They could have, you know, just more or less uh, clogging of the arteries. There's just all kinds of things that, that could cause that vessel to narrow. Well, what happens when you have a blockage of the, the ripe oxygenated arteries and uh, vessels, what happens? You get death of this tissue. Now, see how that is forked there? So that means if you have a blockage, now this one's on one side, but what if the blockage is up here? Now see, this is showing the blockage being more on this, we're going to say this is the right side in this picture, and so that means everything from that point down here could have death of tissue. It's not getting oxygen, and quite frankly, once tissue in the heart dies, it doesn't recover. All right, you don't you don't get that back. Now, can the rest of the heart compensate? Yes, it can, but you're going to have a deficit. And if it's uh, blockage over here, then you can see how this vessel see how this vessel's shorter, but that means this area will get blocked. If it's up here, you've got a huge area that's going to have death of the tissue and it doesn't take long for that tissue to die. So you want to know the signs and symptoms of an MI and you need to know the signs and symptoms of the different diseases that can cause this like hyperlipidemia if there's any signs and symptoms, uh, side effects. One more thing I want to tell you about this picture is that there's, well, there's a couple things. You can always tell if it's the front or the back picture of the heart by looking 
looking at this little apex here, down here at this point, if it's facing this way, then that's the front of the heart. If it's facing this other way, the opposite way, that's the back of the heart. So if you didn't know, all right, and you're, you're second guessing which, uh, which is the front or the back of the heart because maybe you're trying to learn the anatomy of the heart and that makes a difference if we're facing the heart with the apex here, that, that means that the right and left ventricles and atriums, right and left atriums, which side they're on, okay? All right, so, um, and also it would help you identify the valves easier as well if you know that this is the front of the heart and that's the back. Now, another thing for coders that I want you to be aware of, not that you have to memorize this, this is something to be aware of. If you have a blockage of the heart on this side over here, all right, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take the mammary vessel because it runs off across the chest like at the breast area they'll take that vessel from over here and they will link it in and bypass that blocked area okay because that's the easiest way to do that and you'll look at when you're looking at myocardial infarctions and, and the repairs that they do for that you're going to see um, them saying that they use the mammary vessel to, to, to do that but when you have a blockage over here Okay, so that would be like a bypass over here, right? They're going to bypass that. But when you get over here on this portion of the heart, that's when a lot of times they will take vessels from the leg, the other parts of the body, and they will insert them and bypass. So what they would do is they might take a, you know, they would take a vessel from the leg, so you have to code for that, but then they would link it right here above where that blockage is at, okay? So they'd link it there. Then they'd come down here and link it down here again. So it literally bypasses the blocked artery. Isn't that cool? So this area of the heart, often vessels from the leg that are used, this area of the heart, it's often the um, a mammary vessel that's actually just pulled over and linked in. LinkedIn isn't the proper term to use, but if you're, you know, we're getting back to the basics explaining how to do that. And all of this makes a huge difference on the way that it's going to be coded. That's why you need to be aware of it. If you know the anatomy of the heart, then this is going to be easier to do. The, the terms are going to pop off the page for you. Okay, very good. Now, let's get into one of those juicy cakes pieces and let's code it together. This is one of my favorite, favorite things to do on our support calls is to take an encounter or a case, break it apart and code it together. We're going to abstract, we're going to talk about what's pertinent in the coding and we're going to code it. Now, in the future, what I may do with our calls is actually come up with four choices when we do one of these. And and then we can talk about how you would rule out different, um, you know, like why is A ruled out and B is not, okay? Because that's really, really important when you're preparing to test. In real world, uh, we're going to abstract and talk about what's pertinent in the case. And for uh, testing purposes, we're going to abstract, talk about what's pertinent in a case and how to rule out answers quickly. So let's go ahead and jump in here and let me just stop that and refresh. There we go. So this is our encounter and I'm going to make this bigger because I am having trouble seeing it. If I'm having trouble seeing it, then you are too. So we're going to zoom that in and I'm going to make sure it stays in the perimeters that Boyd needs so he doesn't have to do much editing. And even though you can't see me, unfortunately, that's so sad because I'm about to put on my wonderful new readers that we talked about. Very good. Okay, guys, get your readers out if you need them. Lisa says she likes that idea. And, and you know, it is really important. That's what these support cards are for. And that's why we really want you to be able to submit the questions or anything that you're struggling with 
that particular anemia question that came up, and not that case, but and the the reason behind the guidelines were questioned in a uh, in our PBC course uh, chapter four, which is ICD ten, and uh, she was questioning the sequencing for anemia. So it, it, that question came, and I just reworked it a little bit so we weren't showing. Um, um, people that weren't in the course the case so I wrote my own little case there I like to use colors for people here is an actual ER encounter it's been redacted you can tell it's been redacted by me because the person's last name again is a color we have mr. Nathan red he's 85 years old and he has a, and a diagnosis of an acute MI acute myocardial myocardial infarction. Now, if we're abstracting for coding this encounter, because we forked for the facility, uh, maybe we're an outpatient coder for the, for the hospital, then we're going to look at this differently uh, than if we were going back and maybe doing this as a risk adjustment coder. Now, my background is risk adjustment, and so I like to always bring up that it's important to make sure you have your data service, the patient's date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not necessarily talking about that tonight. So if I slip up and I insert that information, forgive me, but some of you might uh, fall in love with risk adjustment, and that would just make me peachy keen happy. So we have a person that's had an acute MI. This is an ER visit. How are they brought in? Uh, to the emergency department. Oh, this is also important, is that they are, uh, they are able to give their history. So when the doctor walks in and he says, you know, how long has this chest pain been going on? Uh, have you ever had this chest pain before? The patient's able to respond right and there's a family member with them okay so there's no history limitations that could make a difference when you're abstracting in the real world as to other things that could be going on with the patient but you know uh, uh, of course having a heart attack is about as good as you can get though right so he's 85 year old and he's having chest pain skimming through the review of systems we know that their main thought right now is just the heart attack okay so they don't care about his integumentary system except for to say if he's cyanotic or something so you notice that's what they're paying attention to respiratory you know he's a little short of breath with minor activity no cough okay so it's not that he's a non-smoker that's pertinent he's got um, chest pain and uh, okay, he's taking medications and negative, negative. So on prednisone maintenance for a blood disorder, that's an that's information um, that's important for several reasons. Be always have a heads up when you see a person on prednisone that can affect their heart. That also really wrecks havocs on diabetics. Okay, so be aware of that that is pertinent okay scrolling down here a little bit I'm sorry that this is going slow I'm gonna to try to use my cursor over here man this is this is the first time in a couple of weeks since I've gotten to do the student support call and I'm just I am excited about all these uh, adventures we're having tonight we're not calling them challenges they're adventures okay so all other symptoms are negative they're strictly fo focused on his airway and his heart. Oh, looky here. So he had a cabbage. And they even have a number for it. So that just means the facility don't work. He's had a hip replacement. He has hypertension. He has prostate cancer. Does he have prostate cancer right now? Quite honestly, he's 85 years old and we probably don't really care, right? I, I don't know. I, I'm just expecting that a lot of men that are 85 probably have some type of prostate cancer whether they know it or not right so that's not our focus the fact that he is he's hypertensive that he's had a cabbage and a, and and the hip replacement not necessarily important but he has had a cabbage so that's good to know okay <coughs> excuse me I'm gonna get another step here <coughs> one moment 
I didn't want to sneeze in your ear. Good, I'm glad you didn't hear me. Active problems, back pain, cabbage, hip replacement, hypertension, and prostate cancer. History, <coughs> just kind of reiterates what we already know. He takes Crestor, that tells us something, huh? Physical exam, it's going to be pretty short and sweet, you know, because when a person's having a suspected heart attack, they go through it pretty quick, let's get to the basics. And everything, you know, the fact that he's alert, he's cooperative, he's warm, that's all good signs. Okay. He has this midline scar. Why does he have a midline scar on his chest? Because he had bypass, right? All right, good. See how it all links together? So he's had some lab tests, and his EKG says he's in sinus tachycardia. Uh, and he it's possible an old MI. Okay, that's all good to know. An old MI code's different than an acute MI. Don't ever get those confused. And I guarantee you that's something that is a huge possibility to see on the CPC exam. Right? Do you know the difference between an old MI and an acute MI? There's guidelines surrounding both. What constitutes an old MI? How many weeks out? And if a person has a hard has an MI, it's common for them to have another MI within a certain amount of time. So, um, so you know, it's a matter of weeks. Right? Impression and plan. We have so this is this is his diagnosis. So he has an, he's having a, a heart attack, an acute MI. And um, then we're going to go ahead, and the course is unchanged. Now again, remember, this is an ER report. They are chopped up and look a whole lot different than a normal report. Right? Um, chances are you're probably not going to see an ER report on the CPC exam that's this format. Okay? They'll do it more of a case versus, even though this is a case, this is an ER report. They're very long. They often have nurses' notes, which I've taken a lot of that stuff out of here. Um, and that's redundant, but I left most of it in. So what are they going to do? They're going to increase the beta blockers, uh, aspirin, ASA is aspirin, Lovenox, heart cath in the morning. They're going to cath him in the morning. So they're not doing another cabbage, right? They're going to give him a heart cath. So um, this is the diagnostic report for the cath. And this is what was done. Now, we're just going to just skim over this. Now, before I go, though, look what they're doing. Look at these veins and um, saphenous vein. Be a good idea to know where that's at. Do not have to memorize it. Just be a, aware of it. Right coronary, left heart calf, left internal mammary left common femoral. These are all terms that are, are uh, locations that I would be aware of if I was you. Allergies. Hey, he's allergic to cardizem. This is the clinical summary. This is all of the information that happened while he was in the ER. This is all the lab tests that were done. They do this uh, uh, serum uh, creatine and that has to do uh, when you have a heart attack, it changes. It, it, your heart is a muscle, and your muscle excretes creatine, and then it, um, um, you know, we run it through our kidneys, but they can do that in a blood test. White blood count, serum sodium, your platelet count, your potassium. Did you know if your potassium is too low or too high, it can make you have a heart attack or feel? like you're having a heart attack. Okay, so they do the procedure. Here is the actual procedure. We're not going to abstract anything from this. 
I would advise you if you've never seen a heart cath done, go out on YouTube and see how they do that. You can see the procedures. You can see uh, ec uh, the actual X-ray where they show the the films of going in and opening up the the arteries, uh, maybe putting in a stent, and uh, you'll see those vessels open up. So images were obtained, and I'm just pulling out, these are the different places that we saw up above that they listed, that they, that they went in and looked at. Advanced is a left coronary vessel, of course it's guided, you'll see this fluoroscopic guidance in all those CPT codes when they're dealing with the, the uh, calf these procedures and again here we go so that's all of the different areas of the heart that they went into now all catheters and wires uh, inserted during the procedure were removed we don't really care about that but we want to make sure that there were no complications doesn't look like there were any complications so that's great here's the studies that tell what was going on he has a 70 percent stenosis of this particular uh, uh, left main um, area and then look he's got 190 percent other places that's that's oh wait 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 no I'm sorry 70 percent stenosis that's you know that's fairly good but a hundred percent stenosis that's bad that means there's just no movement there that's that's bad so and then these um, e, e fraction um, those are important too but again we don't need to know those we don't need to know about the stenosis and everything just be aware that they were uh, they were there in the verbiage okay so now we're down at the end dr. feel good signed off and a good valid signature with his credential all right so let's talk about what we're coding here what jumped out at you one of the things is that our patient had an acute MI now I'm gonna give you the code we're not so concerned about the two uh, CPT codes we will go over those but let's talk about this code right here an ST elevation myocardial infarction of unspecified site and or just a general acute MI this is the default code if you don't know if it's a STEMI or a non STEMI okay and we've done several uh, educational videos on the difference between a STEMI and a non STEMI okay the MI in there just means myocardial infarction the ST elevation talks about where this uh, uh, when you look at the uh, the EKG where it shows that the ST elevation is where the heart attack is or the infarction is okay so we've got a myocardial infarction so I want to do something here though I want to look up in our Clickadex for our people that are relatively new right Clickadex is how we're gonna search the index how are you gonna look up this patient having a heart attack so hopefully this will go quickly for us the key term to look this up what's it gonna be is it you know we know it, it we're, it's the heart we know they're having a heart attack but that's not the medical term so we're not going to look up heart attack um, you know your other terms are myocardial infarction um, is the patient having a myocardial no myocardial just means heart muscle so they're not having a heart muscle what are they having they're having an infarction so let's look up infarction when you go into your index you're going to look up infarction unless uh, okay here we are so again you can look it up there but they're telling me let's look at the different types you have a cerebral infarction right we have a cardial a myocardial infarction so these are not deficits embolisms let's keep looking let's keep looking 
migraine. No, no occlusion. Yes, we do. Artery with infarction. Yeah. Oh, there's that code. Look at that old previous myocardial infarction. We'll take a moment to look at that. Look, a sequela for an infarction, a screening for a myocardial infarction, acute. There's all these awesome codes, right? Okay, so let's just look at the choices. All right, so first, let's 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 go look at this old MI because this is, this is the one where I said, don't ever get confused and use this, you know, one. Now, we, this is um, a, this is where we're going to, uh, go here, right here. Okay, but let's go look at that old one first. Where did I find that? Did I not? Well, let's go ahead and look at this. Infarct. I want to have that. All right, back up here. Look at all these things we can infarct. Coronary artery, see infarct myocardium. Okay, very good. Let's see what else we got here. See how this just breaks it down. Heart, see infarct myocardium. And it'll give you the, the code. Looky there, looky there, looky there. Non STEMI infarction, non Q wave. A STEMI elevation, I21.3. Hmm. But they didn't say that in our diagnosis. They just told us it was an infarction. So if you know, if you've been doing this long enough, you would know that your default is to a STEMI, and that would be our code. Okay? But but we we wouldn't know that um, if you're just starting out. So we're gonna go back up here where it said, hey, look up myocardial. Doesn't matter where we started under gallbladder or anything. Acute with stated duration of four weeks or less, meaning, right, that uh, if it's after four weeks, then it's an old MI. So it tells us hey, if you have an acute myocardial infarction, then it's going to be I. 21.3, which is a STEMI. So let's go ahead and look at that. That's what your index is going to look like. Now we're going to go look at the code, and it's telling us that it's the, this is exactly what I copied and put in that information. What does this include? All of these. I Two, one will include the include these, but we're using point three. Then it says, if applicable, use these additional codes. Well, remember, he's a non-smoker, so we don't have to worry about that, right? So all of these tobacco use, and if you're new to the coding of ICD-10, this is, you know, um, they didn't do that as much in ICD-9 as they do in ICD-10. They want to track how much smoke affects the disease process and that's why these codes are there. We code for statistical purposes. It just happens to be a convenient way to get paid. Now looky here, here we go. It says excludes old MI and then it gives you that code. Okay. And use additional code if there is the presence of hypertension. Hey, our guy had hypertension. Very nice. But actually, this captures everything. So we're good. Let's go real quick before I move on to the next code. Let's go ahead and look at that old MI. So you can be aware of that. I want you to be aware of what it looks like. Sometimes just seeing it helps. Old MI healed myocardial infarction. This is all verbiage you may see. Past MI diagnosed by ECG or other investigation, but currently presenting no symptoms. So um, I can use my mother-in-law for example. She went in and had a uh, an EKG, and they said, "Hey, when did you have a heart attack? When did you have your heart attack?" She goes, "I've never had a heart attack." Oh, 
Okay, well, we're showing here that you actually did have a heart attack at one time <laughs> because once you do, it change. Remember, it's the death of the tissue, so it changes your EKG. And uh, luckily, she's fine. All right, so again, there's your tobacco use or some other information that is statistical. Very good. Any questions so far? Are you seeing anything? Okay, let's go back to our case study. Let's look at bypass status V45.81. That's that is um, that is a ICD-9 code, not an ICD-10 code. Let's see what we get. <laughs> Status codes are Z codes. Yep, ICD-9. So let's go ahead and translate it. We'll see how the verbiage changes. So when you're doing status codes, you're going to see Z codes. We've done some study in status codes for ICD-9 in the past. It would still be uh, an excellent study. Uh, we probably need to do a new lecture on status codes for ICD-10. That's something maybe we can think about for um, our next um, next get together. Okay, so I'm just going to convert these. Slow, slow, slow. See how easy this is? Come on, move down. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to map it. And we're going from 9 to 10. And here, presence of a bike pass graph. That's our code that we want. And that, oh look, it changed in 2016. Excludes complications of devices, no. Uh, Follow-up examination, no. This is just the fact that he has it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, copy it. Let's just actually Let's, let's just run a line through that because this is old. Um, maybe I'll do edit. Nah, I guess don't worry about it then. I know I can do it in here, but no sense in my slow computer. So I'm going to take out V45.81. And I'm going to insert the Z code. There you go, presence of aortal coronary bypass graph. There you go. Very good. Oh, looks like we got a question. I know this that this patient does not have CAD, but how would you code CAD without angina? Uh, status post cabbage. It always confuses me in ICD-10. Fabulous question. Okay, so let's let's go look at that. Now, just before we do that, just notice that um, and our you know our students can go back and look at these other codes for the CPT codes, initial hospital care, and the actual cath procedure that was done. The 99221 and 93459, and don't forget to put in the modifiers. Modifier 25 for 99221, and modifier 26 for 93459. So let's just do um, normally I would go in and make a new page but honestly let's not try to do this on this borrowed computer. So how are we going to code for CAD um, and it's uh, without angina and that is abbreviated S is for without in Latin and uh, but status post 
cabbage. And you're right, it was pretty easy. Well, I don't want to say it was easy, but you know, with ICD-9, I, I think it was pretty, pretty straightforward. So let's let's go, let's go look. Let's let's get rid of these here. And let's do this search. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of ICD-9 here. We don't need that, and we don't need CPT. So I can change what I want on here. Now, okay, there's a couple ways we can do this. And um, we cannot just put in CAD. I don't think it's gonna get anything, but let's try. Let's see what it does with our find a code. Nope, it gives us hex fix codes, so we don't want hex fix. Uh, oh, it did it. Okay, man, they're good. I would not have thought about that. So our basic code, where we're going to start out, is CAD is atherosclerotic heart disease uh, of a native coronary artery. Native means you were born with it. All right. Okay. So let's we're going to start with this I25.1. But look at these other options they brought up. So let, let's just scan them real quick. Give them the old hairy eyeball. So this is native coronary. Um, artery with angina, then you've got without angina, then you've got um, unstable angina. Okay, and notice it's all still I25.1. That's all you know. But you've got um, you've got uh, 0 0.11, 0 0.10, and 0 0.110, which is an extension of this one. All right. So then we've got the CAD native um, coronary vessel with angina with spasms, okay? And they'll tell you that those spasms are involved. Then we have it um, native with, uh, let's see, other type of angina that's not listed there. And then we have native with unspecified, okay? Now, let's let's just look at this code real quick. Let's break this down. First of all, native coronary guideline, or excuse me, or I was already looking at guideline, artery. Let's go back even far, look farther. Let's go to I25. Okay, see all of this stuff. Now, and if you don't know, you know, ischemic, that's why they got the I, you know. Um, uh, let's see, so we've got native, old MI, aneurysm, coronary artery, aneurysm, cardiomyopathy, uh, a silent uh, myocardial ischemia, uh, transplanted heart, isn't that unique? It says, but don't get confused, coronary artery bypass grafts and coronary artery of transplanted heart with angina. So that's a heart that's been transplanted. Other forms and heart disease. So we're going to go back over here. Okay. So we have without, right, is what you said? Yeah, without angina. So let's, let's just go see what this code says. Let's, let's get in the right Let's see if we're in the right area. Ooh, it's being slow. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, always gotta look at the look at the native coronary artery without angina. Right coronary artery right here. See how the heart is going the right way? There we go. Okay, so advantages of having the finder code. Let's look at our excludes. So, use additional codes for these, calcified, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have that. Exclude CAD here. We're going to look at that one here in just a second. Use additional for uh, the tobacco use and stuff like that. Presence of hypertension. And then we get into here, too. 
always look at these. These can po point you in the right direction if you're having trouble finding something. If you're real world coding, or, or even for testing purposes, but see with testing purposes it's a little different because they're giving you the answers. You just have to pick up the best one. But if I, I've done this before where gosh, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the right place, but I can't quite find the code. I'll go to the closest thing I can think of, and sometimes the excludes and the includes will get you to where you want to be. Okay, now that's after you've looked at the index, if it's not popping out at you and, and everything. You know, that's a great way to see. So let, let's go look at this right here. Let's go look at I, 25.7. Here we go. Can you guys see that? I don't know if I can make that bigger. It just seems really small even with my glasses. Let's see. I want to get out of the field for... Okay, here we go. So here's our choices. This is where we want to be. CAD, uh, they've had a cabbage, so there's a graft, unspecified with angina, so we don't want that. Then we have a, a vein bypass. We we don't we don't know if their cabbage was, you know, what their cabbage was. So we can't do that. Plus we want without. So we're looking here and I'm not seeing anything. Everything says with, 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 with. Oh come on. Nothing there. Okay, so what we've got to do is come back up here. Go back, I25. <laughs> Sorry, I'm humming to myself as I'm looking at these again. Let's go back to our tools and let's see if we can find it in the click. Feel free to chime in. Okay, so what we're going to do is look, oh gosh, I don't think it's going to, what do I want to look up? Um, I don't know if it'll let me do coronary at the same time. No, oh, I've got to just do disease. disease. And then we're going to go to coronary. Or we can go to artery, but we'll go coronary. Don't you just love? Ah, oh, here we go. Arterial sclerosis, sclerotic. Hmm. Ooh, Barrett's esophagus. I'm not going to get sidetracked. That's a great one I love to teach about, too. Scrolling slowly, sorry. Here we go. Coronary, there we go. It says go to disease, heart, and this is atherosclerotic, not arteriosclerotic. Okay, so now I need to go down to heart. Here we go, here we go. Maybe I can speed up. I just don't want it to lock up. And here we go. Heart. That's not the right area, but this is. Heart ischemic. That says organic. 
Very good. There we go. Okay. Scroll up. There we go. Okay, that still gets us here, so let's go here and back up. And so I'm not, I don't keep, it's not I25.9, but we'll be able to get to I25 by going over here and clicking this. This is as if you're looking at a view in your manual. I25. Scrolling up. There we go with our spasms. Point one. And up, up, up. This is what we needed. There it is. And I'm reading this in my head, atherosclerotic heart disease of native coronary artery without, hmm, that's our best choice. I25.10, let's see if it also includes All of these, all of these I25.7 has angina. And our patient doesn't, and that is very, very specific. So that's what we need to cut. I'll double check it. Christine says I25.10. Mm. Here we go. With, 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 that's all with angina. This is the code I want. But without. One two five eight one zero. Hmm. Let's see. I two five point eight one zero. I'm gonna look. We need to look at the guidelines, and we also need to look at. Um, that's it. That's what we want. Atherosclerosis of uh, with a bypass without angina. That's it. Right there. I25.810. Anna said that. But Anna said that she disagrees and codes I25.10. Is that what you're saying, Anna? Why do you disagree with I25.810? But is that patient has both native and cabbage? No. Well, just because you, if you've had a cabbage, you've had a change in the, well, not really the structure of the heart, to the fact that you need statistically to let them know that this patient has already had a cabbage. It doesn't matter that the blockage may or may not be where it was blocked before. It probably isn't because there's a cabbage there. The key is you want to let them know you have CAD, they've already had a cabbage, and they don't have angina right now. So Christine says, oh, I see it is of the bypass graph. See, they're not coding, you're not coding and saying that there's blockage again of that particular artery that was bypassed before. You're telling them that the patient has had a cabbage before and they don't have chest pain and that you're going to go in and do it again, that you're going to go in and, and, and um, 
and you're going to go in and, and do more work on the heart. And they've had a previous cabbage before. And then, of course, you've got the, you've got the status post-cabbage to go. So I guess technically, and this is something I'm going to have to investigate. So we can hold this over we'll, because I don't want to um, keep going. And I also don't want to tell you inaccurately. That is a big problem. Um, there is something interesting that, you know, coders are constantly learning and tweaking their knowledge. You know, and there is different, 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 uh, different opinions on the way things are coded. A lot has to do with the terminology and the verbiage of the information that you're given in the report and uh, the documentation that's given that can make things clear. You have to follow the guidelines that, you know, the coding clinic really opens up um, stuff uh, as well. But the, the fact is, is that, you know, never feel like you can't question what someone tells you they have to be able to prove it to you right now don't go and question the provider like that that's not what I'm saying I'm just saying that you know if you have a coder that comes in and says oh well, I code it this way you say oh okay what was your thought process so that I can you know um, compare it to what I was thinking and and so that being said I don't want to tell you something wrong just because we're doing it on the cuff um, and it also lets you know that I don't know everything, guys. I go and I look things up constantly. So I love ICD-10. I love the disease process. And I love that it's like this ever-evolving behemoth of a, of, I don't want to say it's a monster, but it, you know, it's just always changing. So um, Christine says, if the site of the CAD is not specified, then native arteries. Um, you know, I, I like that that um, way of thinking, Christine. So let me do some investigating. And for our students and our CCO club members, I can put this in our um, in our CCO club, the investigating and the, the information that I found. And then um, we can also go over it uh, next time. Let's see, next time Chandra will be up, but the week after that I'll be up again so we'll we'll revisit it uh, but definitely go into the CCO club and um, I'll, I'll do some more investigating and see my understanding at this point and it could change if it does not tell you that and and, and quite honestly you know they've got to get in there and look if the blockage is of the vessel that was grafted then of course it's a no-brainer, right? You know, then we don't have to think about that. Uh, however, if it's not, my understanding in the past, okay, and take this with a grain of salt, is the reason that we coded it that way in ICD-9 was because it told you that that heart had a cabbage, okay? That was important to know. This was post-cabbage, that they're coming back in for another cabbage. Now we have, we have the Z code to explain that, right? The status code that they're post graft. So let me check with our um, auditing crew there on CCO and, and let's get a definite answer of why they would code it one way uh, versus another and if there's any documentation that would, would change that. Okay? What a great, great question. I love it when you guys come up with questions, especially to stump me because. <laughs> I, I, it just means I'm going to learn some. Okay, let's go back to our, our slides real quick because we're getting close to the end and we kind of got a late start, guys, so I apologize uh, for that. And hopefully by the time that we, it's my turn to do the support call again, not next week, but the week after, I'll be back with my fixed computer that crashed and we will be able to... I'll be up and speedy again. So exam prep, just a heads up guys, don't forget, practice exams. Do as many as you can get your hands on. We have three paid, we have more than one free because we have the CPC, we have the ICD-10, we have the COC that you could take, even if you're taking the CPC, it's just a little bit different. It would be a good practice exam. 
and we have the three paid exams and they are working on more. So, um, you know, we, we now have the CRC practice exam and we have the uh, billing practice exam and that is a big, uh, a big item on our agenda is having more practice exams for you for everything that uh, credential that we teach with but especially the CPC exams and for you that are getting ready to um, test ha how many of you guys that are on the call do you have your uh, bat do you have your CPT manuals batted mm-hmm yeah that's what you want to have done before you set for the CPC exam. Not only is it going to make codes leap off the page at you when you're looking at your choices, it's going to speed you up. It saves an amazing amount of time where you're not second guessing yourself and you're looking at the code and then looking back, looking at the code and looking it back. You know, you waste precious seconds just doing that, verifying that you do have the right code. And when you have the BET technique done in your CPT manual, you are good to go. Don't forget our ICD-10 manuals. We have the, the blitz, the ICD-10 blitz that gives you all those annotations that you need for ICD-10 that will also make um, those guidelines pop off the page for you. And, and believe you me, I'm going to go look up um, the ICD-10 CAD stuff because um, Chandra did those and she made some excellent notes practice exams when you do them you want to be getting an 85% or better when you can get an 85% or better that tells you you're ready to go okay you can sit for that C uh, CPC uh, with confidence let's see uh, let's see Lisa has written let's Let's go to our recap. But Lisa has a question. That says, "What is Chandra's errata book like? That is for sale. It's quite fabulous. Got lots of really good information in it. I believe it is Spiral, and um, they've been flying off the shelves. Um, and you're going to be able to use that um, to um, make notes in your uh, manuals. But I believe." Don't quote me on this because I have to double check it, but I think you're able to take it into the exam with you. Because uh, just just don't don't quote me on that. Double check that. Uh, Lisa, also, uh, different Lisa. We have more than one Lisa on our calls. I'm working on mine now, even though I do have my CPC because I know how much it helps. That's right. Every year, bubble highlight annotate uh, your manuals because it's going to make a difference in real world coding, right? We're not here just to help you pass the exam. Uh, one of the big advantages of the CCO club is the fact that you uh, can be a member and keep access to all of our content for as long as you're a member and you can get the updates for the, um, the manuals. Yeah, if you are a Blitz purchaser. Uh, and um, Rihanna says, uh, is the CPC exam for the 2017 going to be uh, by sections? Yeah, it's, it's set up just, just like the others. You can go and uh, look at the AAPC and see how it's divided up, how many questions are in each section. And I believe it even goes in order that it, it'll be. Usually, you know, the anatomy and the terminology is all at the back of the exam. You know, I always like knocking those out right away. I, I, do, I tend to do uh, my exams backwards. I don't know why I think it, it helps my brain. When I don't do that, I don't do as well on board exams. So let's talk about our re um, our recap. If you have more questions, don't forget send them into the C um, the CCO club. So anemia uh, with patients. Let's see here. Who have? Oh, I didn't do that right. Come on, slow computer. Patients with um, uh, taking chemotherapy. So anemia with who have cancer. <laughs> That's funny. I can't type. Uh, myocardial infarction. Acute, old, and then we also talked about STEMI is the default, right? That's very important. We looked a little bit at CAD. A 
peek into coding for CAD. How about we will revisit? Anything else that we need to put on here for our recap? Of the heart. Anatomy of the heart, quick review. Know the heart, guys. Oh, let's see. Yeah, we did um, old, so we also did uh, old MI. Old MI. Uh, it's been four weeks. Very good. Anything else pop up for you guys? If not, we're going to wrap it up. Again, guys, I have to tell you, this is a lot different than we usually do for our new people. Our uh, support calls are very different. You usually get to see me. I think that's a lot of interaction. Um, we sometimes have people that, you know, have mics where they can talk, but uh, you guys are doing great to, tonight by uh, giving your input. It is perfectly fine to ask questions off the cuff and for us to look at some other things as long as we have time um, we could we could call it you know uh, stump the instructor I guess <laughs> uh, and uh, so we'll definitely uh, look into the CAD the, the CAD with cabbages will come up with a better understanding of how to code that properly because it's a fabulous question it's very tricky and you probably are going to be tested on it because I know that um, it, it's a very common one to be tested on. I'll review the guidelines. You can go and review the guidelines of that as well. And um, if you come up with a, a plan, then submit it. Uh, come into the CCO club if you're not already a member. Uh, just go to cco.us uh, backslash club and get the information. Great FAQs and Will uh, Chandra will be up next week. She's not having any trouble with her computer, so you'll be able to see her pretty face, and um, the slides will probably be much faster. So thanks and good night, everyone. I enjoyed seeing your names come across the chat, and welcome to those uh, sneak peek YouTubers and Facebook Live people. Um, this won't stay up, so you won't be able to have access to this again. We just wanted to kind of give you a peek as to what we do when we have our student support calls every week. All right. And oh, wait, I got one more slide, guys, for you because it's so pretty. Look, I said go forth and code if it'll come up. There you go. Isn't that beautiful? Go forth and code. <laughs> All right, guys. Goodbye.